Hi, church. Well, how do you feel when I say death is coming? How do you feel about the fact that our time here on earth is short? With the coronavirus, it's probably fair to say there's never been a time in any of our lives where death has been on the minds of almost every person on the planet for the same reason. So how do you feel about the fact that death is coming to you? For some of us, we might feel that we don't need a reminder. We don't need a reminder, especially from some young guy, because the ache that we have in our back and the number of pills we have to take every morning is enough of a reminder that our lives are short. For others of us, we might live every single day in fear of death. And so we try and extend our lives by the latest diet fads or anything else we can think of so that we can live for longer. For others of us, we might not be so worried about death itself, but the trouble and sorrow that we have in our life before death comes. For others of us, we might, uh, it might not really worry us that death is coming. We're young and we feel like death is such a long way off. We should just enjoy life now while we have it. We shouldn't weigh ourselves down with these negative thoughts. YOLO. So friends, how do you feel about the fact that death is coming. Well, Psalm 90, the psalm we're looking at today, helps us as Christians to think and feel rightly about the fact that our time is short. And this psalm, the little introduction tells us, is a prayer of Moses. And it was probably written by Moses as an older man looking back on the life that he had lived. If you know the story of Moses, you know it's a story of God rescuing his people from slavery in Egypt and bringing them into the promised lands. But there was a problem. Moses didn't quite make it into the promised lands. You see, because of their sin, God told Moses and the people of Israel that no one from that generation would enter into the promised lands. Instead, the people of Israel would spend the next 40 years or so wandering around in a desert, waiting for a whole generation to die off and waiting for Moses himself to die before they would be allowed to enter into the promised lands, lands flowing with milk and honey. And this psalm was probably written around this later stage of Moses' life as he looked back on the life he had lived and as he reflected on the the number of days he had left to live. And I want to see four main things uh, from the text today. I want us to see, first off, the eternity of God and the mortality of people. Next, we're going to see the reason why people are mortal. Thirdly, we're going to see a prayer that Moses prays for God to relent. And then lastly, we're going to see how Jesus answers Moses' prayer. But before we dig in, let me pray for God's help today as we look at this text. Father, thank you so much for this psalm. Please help us now by your spirit to understand it. Help us to see it as good and help us to rejoice in the hope that Jesus gives us. Amen. Well, this psalm starts off with Moses reflecting on a difference between God and people. And the difference that Moses reflects on is this. is that God is eternal, without a start and without an end. Whereas people, well, we're mortal. We're, we're transient. Our life ends in death. Have a look at verse 1. Moses says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. See, Moses is reflecting on the nature of God. And he says that God has always been Israel's dwelling place. Or as other translations might put it, God has always been Israel's home or refuge or hiding place. 
But friends, the, the emphasis in this verse is the fact that God has always been Israel's dwelling place throughout all generations. In other words, generations might come and generations might go, but God has always been there. And it's the same thought in verse 2. What's the oldest thing that Moses could think for as he was wandering around the desert? Well, it was the mountains. It was the earth. What's older than them? Well, God is. Because God has existed forever. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He's without a start and without an end. He's always been and he always will be God. It's mind-boggling to think about, isn't it? You think about children as they learn numbers. They think of thousands and maybe trillions and or billions or gazillions. This week I learned that the biggest number that we have a name for is called a Googleplex. A Googleplex is a one followed by 100 zeros. But God has existed for a trillion Googleplexes. God has existed for infinitely long and he's going to keep on existing for just as long. He's never going to end. He's always been and he always will be God. But what about us? Because our experience of time is different, isn't it? Verse 3, you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. You sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. See, our experience of time, Moses says, is different than God's because it's limited. It's, it's bound by death. This week in my research, I learned that the lifespan of a blue whale is 90 years. The average Australian lives for 82 years. Ibises can live for up to 28 years. Mosquitoes live for just seven days. And Moses says there's a type of grass that he knows of that only lasts for one day. And Moses says that compared to God's infinite nature... We're like that grass. We're like that grass that just lasts for one day before we're swept away in the sleep of death. Moses is reflecting on the fact that there's a big gap between the eternal nature of God who is from everlasting to everlasting and our experience of time, which starts with birth and is limited by death. But why? Why is this? Well, that's what Moses goes on to speak about. Why are people mortal? And what the Bible says is that there is a clear reason why people are mortal, why our time is bound by death. It hasn't always been this way. You see, in the Bible, when God made the world, in the book of Genesis, we see that death wasn't in the world. There was no death in the world. It wasn't until Adam and Eve rebelled against God that death entered the world. And that's what Moses talks about next. He says, we are mortal because of God's anger for sin. Verse 7, we are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Do you see what this passage is saying? It's saying that God knows all of our sin, even the sins we've done in secret, and he's angry. God is angry with our sin, and that's why we are mortal. That's why our life is cut short by death. One author puts it like this. He says, we are mortal because God is angry. And God is angry because we are sinners. But it's not only that we die. It's also that life that we have is filled with trouble and sorrow. 
Verse 10, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. The oldest man living in Australia at the moment is 110-year-old Dexter Kruger. And some of you might say, wow, 110 years. He's had a good life, hasn't he? And it's true, there would have been many happy times uh, in those days that Dexter Kruger has been alive. But think about what he's lived through. He would have lived through World War I, the Spanish flu, the, De- the Great Depression, World War II and the invention of the atomic bomb, the Cold War, the GFC, and now COVID-19. And friends, that's to say nothing at all about the personal struggles he's had, the personal relationship breakdowns he's had, the sickness he's experienced, the trouble of seeing the work of his hands rust away, seeing all of his other friends and family die away and knowing that one day soon death would come for him. And friends, if he would go on living, his life would still only be filled with trouble and sorrow. The trouble and sorrow would keep coming. God's anger is like a shadow that hangs over our head every day of our lives, reminding us of the death that is to come. But what Moses says next, I think, is even scarier than that. Verse 11, he says, If only we knew, if only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. If only we knew, Moses says, It's like the trouble and sorrow of life and death is only the tip of the iceberg compared to what's coming. And friend, that's true because in this passage, Moses hasn't even talked about hell. We know from the rest of the Bible that God's anger for sinners doesn't stop with death. God's anger will burn on forever and ever against those who aren't saved by him in hell. Suffering and death now are only a taste of what's to come. God won't let us rebel against him forever. And so we're swept away in death. And verse 12 says that a wise person will realize this. A wise person will reflect on this reality and live their lives accordingly. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. 30,112 days. 30,112 days. That's the average number of days that an Australian lives for. Friends, how far through are you? How many days do you have left? This psalm shows us that it's right to grieve death, but we must grieve death rightly. A wise person will grieve death, number their days, fear God, and live accordingly. Well, verse 13 in this psalm is a bit of a turning point. It changes from Moses grieving sin and death to uh, to Moses asking God to relent, asking God to turn away from his anger. Look at verse 13. Relent, Lord, Moses says. Turn away from your anger. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. And the rest of this prayer in verses 14 to 17 is is Moses just expanding on, on what it would look like if God were to relent from his anger. So what would it look like for God to relent from his anger? Well, verse 14, satisfaction. Not satisfaction here and now in worldly pleasures that won't last, but satisfaction both now and in eternity in God's unfailing love. Verse 15, it'll look like a gladness. Life for Israel and life for us is full of trouble and sorrow. So Moses longs for gladness for as many days as he's seen trouble. Verse 16, seeing God act. 
Moses and Israel had seen God act in saving them from Egypt. And they wanted more. They wanted their children to see God's splendor. Verse 17, work that lasts. Israel were constantly on the, their, on the move, uh, setting up camp and then packing it away. So they wanted work that would last into eternity. So friends, God relenting, turning away from anger, Moses longed for satisfaction, for gladness to see God act and to have work that would last. These are the things Moses wanted. And friends, if we're honest with ourselves, who wouldn't want these things? But Moses never quite saw the answer to his prayer. He never fully experienced the answer to his prayer for God to relent. You see, he died in the desert. He still experienced death and he was never able to enter into the promised lands. But the promised lands weren't the answer to, to Moses' prayer either. Because the, the exiles, uh, hundreds of years later, would have prayed this same prayer. No, Moses, through this prayer, was prophesying. He was looking ahead to a future day when God would relent, when God would turn away from his anger. And friends, that day is today. For us now, Moses' prayer has been answered. God has relented. You see, after Moses came someone who understood this psalm more than anyone who has ever lived. Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus was the eternal Son of God. Not created, but he existed with the Father in the Trinity for eternity past. From everlasting to everlasting. But what did he do? Well, he took on the mortality of people. He took on flesh and blood and became a man. Can you comprehend how big a thing this is? The eternal Son of God, who was from everlasting to everlasting, limits himself by becoming a mortal man. He puts himself under the wrath of God. He experiences the troubles and sorrows of life and he is swept away in death. What a mystery this is. The immortal God dies. But why? Why would the eternal God become a mortal man? Friends, Jesus did this to answer Moses' prayer. Jesus did this so that God would relent. Have a look at John chapter 3, verse 36. He says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Friends, for those of us who believe in Jesus, Moses' prayer has been answered. God has relented. We have life with him forever to look ahead to. Satisfaction and gladness with God. The eternal nature of God that Moses reflected on is the nature that we now get to share in. But whoever rejects the Son, well, they will not see life. God's anger remains on them. The trouble and sorrow of life and death is only the beginning of the anger of God that they're going to experience. So friends, if you're listening today and you're not a Christian, believe in Jesus, believe in the Son and have life with Him forever. But what about us as Christians? How does this psalm help us think and feel rightly about the time we have left until death. Well, I want to finish uh, with an illustration. I've got some rope here. Uh, and I want you to imagine that this rope here uh, doesn't just uh, end off the screen here, but imagine that it keeps going on off the screen. It goes uh, out of the studio, down the road through Auburn and Newington and, and Wentworth Point, uh, And it goes off then around the world a few times and off into space for eternity.
Well, friends, I want you to imagine that, that this rope is a timeline. I want you to imagine that this little blue bit here on the end is your time here on earth. Well, what this psalm shows us is that we don't think about time as just being this. We think about time as being all of this. We think about time as going on forever and ever into eternity. You see, what we might be tempted to do, we might be tempted to think about time as only being this. And so we worry so much and we work so hard uh, that we can, you know, at this point in our life here, we can get married. Maybe at this point here, we can uh, get a new job and buy a house. And at this point here, we can go on a holiday. But friends, what about all of this? As Christians, we can't think about time as only being this part here that we have on earth. We must think about time as being all of this, as going on and on for eternity. Think about what Moses prayed for in verse 15. He said, Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. See, what Moses was saying is that if he's had this many years of trouble and sorrow, he prayed that God would double that over and instead give us joy. But that wasn't enough for God. Because in Jesus, uh, God has given us satisfaction and gladness forever into eternity. But not only that, Moses' prayer, verse 17, establish the work of our hands for us. God has answered this prayer too in Jesus. Jesus has given us new work to do, work that will last both now and into eternity. Kingdom work. Friends, from what I see in the Bible, there's only two things that we have here that will last into eternity. Only two things that will last from this world here into eternity. First, people. And second, godliness. Friends, imagine how good it's going to be in eternity when we're in heaven with God and with others. Imagine someone coming up to you and saying, I'm here in eternity in heaven because you told me about Jesus. Imagine having a friend come up to you in heaven and saying, you helped me that time to turn away from that sin. Imagine the Father, the eternal God, saying to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. So friends, how are you living now for the eternity that is to come? How are you involved now in the work that will last into eternity forever? It doesn't make sense for Christians to only think about the life that they have here and to not think at all about the eternity that is to come. Friends, grieve the sorrows and troubles of life. Grieve death. But rejoice that Jesus has answered Moses' prayer. God has relented. And we will share eternity with him. Let me pray. God, you have placed eternity in our hearts. Yet what we experience now on earth is trouble and sorrow and death. And we know that this is because of your anger for our sin. But thank you for Jesus, the everlasting Son of God. Thank you that he took on flesh and he experienced the troubles and sorrows of life. Thank you that he tasted death for us. Help us now to live life in light of that. Help us to live life in light of the eternity that is to come for us. Amen.